All right. Today is Sunday, February 27th. This is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the week to come. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, but let's start with this. There are a lot of scams in the comments, and I just want to clarify, I will never scam you via WhatsApp or any other mean of communication. Believe it or not, this is my part-time job. I wake up at 5 and I start working right away. And I'm not done till 9 in the evening. So I'm the hardest working guy in America. I have 2 hours from 9 to 11 to spend with my family. And then I have to go to sleep and lather, rinse, repeat. So I have no time to scam you at all. If I'm going to scam you, I'm going to make it a little spicy. I'm going to add a little flavor to it. I'm going to hire a hot chick who's going to fart in a jar, that kind of stuff. So be careful out there. And with that out of the way, the stock market continues to rally on World War III optimism. Where are the bears, you might ask? Well, the bears got a little fat. It's been a nice meal so far this year. And they're relaxing right now. They're resting like Hank the Bear. Who's Hank the Bear, you might ask? Hank the Bear is the alter ego, the muse of this channel. And unfortunately, the authorities in Tahoe, they want to euthanize Hank the Bear. Why do they want to euthanize Hank the Bear? The answer is because he's been stealing a lot of leftover pizza. And I say next time you see Hank the Bear, threw in a few cans of beer, the guy's thirsty. But here's my warning to the authorities in Tahoe. If a hair on Hank the Bear is touched, oh boy, the revolution will start right away. Bring out the pitchforks, the guillotines, and the rest. So you better watch out there. Do not touch Hank the Bear. Anyways, why was the market higher on Friday, you might ask? We already explained that. It is all about the Fed, not about Russia-Ukraine. When Russia-Ukraine becomes an inflation problem, then the market gets rattled. But when the Russia-Ukraine crisis is not an inflation problem, the market could care less at all. But speaking of Hank the Bear, every time we got an intraday 5% plus reversal, at least in the last 21 times, they all happened in bear markets. What does that mean? It means that in all likelihood, we are in bear market territory. Matter of fact, the Nasdaq is already down 20% plus top to bottom. Now, what usually happens in bear markets? We have something we call bear market rallies. They're impulsive. They can produce sizable gains in a short amount of time. We've seen that in individual stocks, by the way. Certain stocks from Thursday all the way to Friday's close are up over 10%. But then what happens after that? The bear market theme resumes, meaning the stock market continues to go down. So we're now waiting and waiting for a reversal signal. Of course, the worst case scenario is if the reversal signal happens in the pre-market, meaning tonight, if the futures gap down big, because we have a lot of bulls or non-bulls who bought the dip and they are expecting the rally to last for at least three days, four days, maybe a week or so, and then they wake up on Monday with a nice spy in the face. We're not saying that's going to happen, but you got to watch out for that. And by the way, who bought the dip? big time. The answer is, once again, you and I, baby, the mom and pops, battered, although we're not battered. You and I are not battered. We're sitting on a mountain of gains. But the headline reads, battered U.S. retail investors bought latest dip Vanda Research says. So what did they buy? Here it is. We believe that retail investors played a key role in driving the sharp rebound in equities yesterday, meaning Thursday, said Giacomo Pierantoni, head of data at Vanda Research said in a note. The benchmark index rose 2.24% on Friday, cutting its year-to-date losses to 8%. Earlier data showed that buying by retail investors ebbed in last week, with flows falling by 50% to $1.8 billion in the week to Wednesday, according to JP Morgan. So here it is. The retail crowd bought Tesla, AMD, Facebook, and Roku. Clearly, they're buying the retail favorite names once again, buying these dips, expecting these names to go back to all-time highs. In other words, catching the falling knife one more time. But the action from retail investors remain confusing because they're buying oil, they're buying gold, they're buying VIX ETFs, they're also buying inverse indices, the likes of the SQQs. So in other words, the retail crowd is taking a significant amount of risk here, buying the high multiple names and then trading the high volatility names, oil, VIX, the inverse indices, and I assume all via options, of course. And my message is, take your profits quickly. Always, always be closing. Always be closing in this kind of market. And folks, let's move on to the main topic of this video. 
And here it is, in focus tonight. Nuclear optimism. And let's revisit the wall of worry. We have Russia, we have China, we have the hawk, most importantly, of course. We have the brothel in DC, and then we have the thing. We start with the most active item in the wall of worry, which is Russia. What's going on in Russia? And Ukraine, of course. Not so hot, so this is the map for the advancement of Russian troops so far in Ukrainian territories. And as you can see, not a lot of progress so far, but the developments are happening rapidly. And of course, we have a massive crash in the Russian stock market. Matter of fact, two hundred billion dollars wiped out from the Russian stock market of gone. And I assume they don't have put options in Russia. So if you thought you had a bad week in the stock market, think again, because uh, the Ruskies got it really bad. But rest assured, the Russians have another trick up their sleeve. And it involves a $300 billion worth of foreign currency held in offshore swaps. If these swaps are moved or dumped abruptly, it's going to cause a lot of chaos in global markets. But the recent sanctions frozen the accounts of the Russian central banks. So it's hard to see how would that happen, at least for now. And of course, the sanctions extended to include Russia's exclusion from the SWIFT banking system. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything at all because there is one caveat with all of this sanctioning. Here it is. US and EU working with SWIFT to determine whether energy-related transactions can be exempted from the ban or if there are certain banks that conduct most energy transactions that could be exempted. Da -da -da -da. A White House official said in a briefing call with reporters. But it gets even better. The German government says that the ban officially affects the Russian banks that were already sanctioned a few days ago. Once again. Da -da -da -da. Which are big important banks, but obviously already under sanctions. So all of these sanctions are bullshit I told you from the get-go. Why didn't the US sanction oil transactions? Here it is. The US says it won't sanction Russian crude oil because that would harm US consumers and not Vladimir Putin. Oh yeah, we're already harmed, baby. Crude oil prices are moving higher either way. And of course, this is all done for a reason. Because the worst case scenario, and by the way, if you want to pause the video and read all of this, go ahead. But the worst case scenario is if European gas supply is halted and oil disrupted, we see a significant global risk off shock. What will happen in the US impact? The worst case scenario is energy spike combines with unanchored inflation expectations and Fed has to tighten as demand slows. And this will indeed crash the stock market a minimum of 20%. And if that happens, by the way, say goodbye to European economies and stock markets, specifically Germany and the UK. So much for the call by JP Morgan earlier this year when they said you have to rotate from the US to European markets because that's where the opportunity is. That's where value is. What a great call once again by JP Morgan. And by the way, the worst case scenario, it's already underway. Ukraine's grid operator said it is unable to transit any additional Russian gas to Europe as it faces extreme quote-unquote circumstances. So here we go, here we go. And I know a lot of you ask me all the time, what's with all of this talk? I don't understand anything you're talking about. Just give me the trade. What should I buy? What should I sell? What should I short? That's it. So here it is. When we look at emerging markets, for example, and the impact of any oil disruption or a significant increase in oil prices, as you can see, the economies on top will get hit the most. Thailand, South Korea, India, South Africa, Taiwan, Chile. The economies at the bottom will benefit the most. Saudi Arabia, Russia, we really gotta avoid Russia right now. But Colombia, Mexico, Brazil, and that's about it. Because Argentina has many other problems, and Egypt, by the way, we will talk about Egypt in a second, but it will suffer tremendously in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Now, look for example at the South Korean economy and its dependency on Russian imports. In 2021, the South Korean economy imported over 2.9 million tons worth of gas from Russia, 7.9 million tons of crude, and 22 million tons of of call. Now combine that with the disruption of the Ukrainian economy, also known as the breadbasket of Europe, which by the way, the geniuses like Jason Furman and Scumbagamushi say, oh, it's not that important. Ukraine is just a poor country. Really? Russia's invasion of Ukraine has cut off a breadbasket that accounts for more than a quarter of global wheat trade and nearly fifth of corn. So yeah, 
it is important. And as you can see, the ports in Ukraine where the wheat trade happens, all of these ports are being disrupted by the conflict right now. So forget about wheat moving out of Ukraine to the countries that import wheat from that particular country. What does that mean? A massive shortage of supply, wheat prices will continue to spike higher. Any dips in wheat should be bought right away. And here it is, we're talking about Egypt, right? Egypt imports most of its wheat from Ukraine and Russia. Tunisia was already struggling to pay for grain imports as Ukrainians suffered during the invasion. The upheaval threatens to further strain economies across the Middle East as well. So this is a conflict that goes beyond the borders of Russia and Ukraine. By the way, as I've been telling you in this program from the get-go, and as you can see, Turkey is the biggest importer of Russian wheat and grains in general, Iran at number two, Egypt number three, Saudi Arabia number four, and the list goes on. So most of these countries are highly dependent on imports from Russia and Ukraine to eat. And last time we saw a hunger crisis in the Middle East, by the way, that was the catalyst for the Arab Spring. So watch out here. Cue the Elmo with the fire. We could get a lot of action from this point on. And it gets even better. How would you like to see World War III for real? Not in Call of Duty. Like this is real action. You're feeling it, you're finding it, and you die, and you can't put more coins in the arcade machine and come back. Would you like to see that? Because we're upping the ante by the day. And now the German Chancellor says we're sending weapons to Ukraine. Directly. And oh, by the way, we're upping our military spending big time. So here we go. All of these countries, it's going to be a race to the bottom here. Every country is going to spend billions and billions of dollars more in armament, armament, and then whoops, somebody hit somebody by an accident. And here we go, World War III. And who benefits from all of this, you might ask? The military industrial complex. Surprise, surprise. All of these defense stocks to the moon. Raytheon, BAE Systems, General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, Northrop, all of these companies are going to benefit tremendously from the insane spending on defense that we're about to see. We're going to talk about Russia once again when I answer questions by the viewers. And I'm going to go a little bit hardcore here at the risk of perhaps uh, this channel getting banned. We'll see. But before we do that, let's go to the wall of worry once again. Do we have anything about China? Because China is speaking with both sides of the mouth. On one side, they say, watch out, Taiwan, you're next. Yet on the other side, they say, hey, Russia, keep it down, calm down, what's going on here? Matter of fact, in a puzzling move, Chinese banks are restricting lending to Russian counterparts. This could be a facade, of course, and behind the scenes, they're collaborating. You can bet on that. And the Chinese, at least on the surface, are pushing the Russians to negotiate with Ukraine. So we'll see what happens there, but don't trust China here. Because on one hand, China has its own economic interests that they have to look for. When we talk about the economic interest, this conflict is not good for them from an economic standpoint. For example, look at China's imports from Russia. We're talking about over 80 billion dollars. More than half of these imports are energy imports, specifically oil. So if oil prices continue to move higher, the Chinese economy will get crippled too. There is no escape of that. But on the other hand, the Chinese are also waiting and watching how the world is going to react to Russia because this is an experiment for them when Taiwan's turn on the chopping block comes. Now let's visit the hawk and the central banks in general because this is what really matters to the stock market. Inflation and the impact of inflation on the monetary policy globally. The market could care less about Russia, Ukraine, Belgium, Australia, Brazil, that doesn't matter. All what the market cares about is the Fed and the impact of the monetary policy. What impacts the monetary policy is inflation. If the conflict produces more inflation, then the conflict becomes relevant to the stock market. And here's what's going on with energy prices in the European Union before the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. As you can see, prices in Belgium, for example, the inflation is up over 70% year over year. Netherlands, up over 60% year over year. Germany, up over 40% year over year. France, over 20%. Spain, over 20%. And all in all, the European Union also, over 20% inflation in energy prices year over year. So again, any more disruption to the supplies from Russia, Ukraine to European markets will push this inflation even higher, and this will prompt central banks to have no other choice but to become even more hawkish and increase interest rates further. Now, the forecast, this is a joke, of course. They say that the ECB will increase 25 basis points by October of this year. I say, let's say by April, maybe June of this year. We know the ECB is zombified. We know that they have no greater interest but to push equities prices higher at any cost, even if it means an insane hyperinflation in the continent of Europe. 
when are they going to wake up? And the longer they wait, by the way, the greater the likelihood that they're going to have to slam their foot in the brakes at some point and crash all of these economies into a recession. What about the US? What's going on with the Fed? Well, Larry Summers came out and said that the Federal Reserve should not be deterred by the action in Russia, Ukraine, because they're already way behind the curve. The longer they wait, the longer they kick the can down the road, the higher inflation will get and the more aggressive the approach to remedy this inflation will be. When we talk about the aggressiveness of the remedy, we're now talking about a recession, perhaps a mild recession. But the longer they wait, it's going to be a severe recession and at some point a depression the likes that we have never seen in almost a hundred years. Thank you once again to the delusional madman Jerome Powell. And don't forget his allies and puppeteers. Here's another joke for you, the CPI forecast by the Bureau of Labor Kitchen Statistics. The actual CPI right now is around 7.5%. In reality, it is 15%. But either way, this is the cooked number. Listen to this. This is absolutely comical. They break down the scenarios of oil prices and the impact on the CPI. They say if oil prices at around 90 to 95 bucks a barrel, that inflation is already peaking and it's going to go down from this point on. But if oil prices at 75 bucks a barrel, then inflation has a little more to go. It's going to be at around 7.5%, 8% for a little while, and then it's going to peak and go down from this point on. So apparently inflation is going to go higher on lower oil prices, not higher. What a joke. And then they say if oil prices is at 120 bucks a barrel, then they say that inflation will go all the way to around 8.5% at around March, and then it's going to peak from that point on and move downward. Let me fix all of this for you. Here it is the CPI forecast to the moon. And by the way, when we talk about consumer spending, we already exhausted stimmies number one. We exhausted stimmies number two. We're now swiping those credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down to chase inflation higher. So again, are you really that delusional to believe that inflation is going to cool down anytime right now, absent an aggressive stance by the Federal Reserve? Think again. Now, let's go back to the wall of worry. What about the brothel? Anything new with the brothel? Not at all. There's nothing going on. Matter of fact, they are in a recess. Yep, your beloved politicians are in a vacation while we have World War III going on right now. What about the thing? Anything new about the thing? Here's the risk. The truth is starting to come out. What does that mean? Uh, if you have any Pfizer, Moderna, you might want to get out right now before the can of worms come out. Because have you noticed that every so-called conspiracy theory is turning out to be true? For example, here's one of them. The CDC has collected stockpiles of critical data on COVID hospitalizations and booster shots, but most of that information has not been made public. That's according to a report from the New York Times. Specifically, the CDC has yet to publish its data on hospitalizations broken down by age, race, and vaccination status. The agency also has not released information about the effectiveness of boosters in adults under 50. A spokeswoman for the CDC told The Times the agency has been reluctant to release certain data because they fear it could be misinterpreted. You forgot to say misinterpretation, wink, wink. The CDC is just looking out for you. They're hiding the data just to look out for you. You might misinterpret the data a little bit and have some buyer's remorse, you know, about all of these shots you've been taking. Maybe Joe Rogan is going to be proven right at some point. We cannot allow that to happen. And by the way, these are the same motherfuckers who are right now doing propaganda, war propaganda, when it comes to Russia, Ukraine. You cannot trust anything you hear. Another one of those so-called conspiracy theories that is now proven to be true. Listen to CEO of Moderna, Stephanie Bensel, who was in Fox Business, and he got hit with the read. Well, I'm surprised that she even asked him this. Take a listen. Uh, let me ask you what the Daily Mail is reporting. It says more evidence COVID was tinkered with in a lab. Now scientists find the virus contains a tiny chunk of DNA that matches sequence patented by Moderna three years before the pandemic began. Your reaction, Stefan, what can you tell us? So my scientists are looking into those data to see how accurate they are or not. As I've said before, the hypothesis of an escape from a lab by an accident is possible. You know, human makes mistakes. So uh, is it possible that the Wuhan lab in China was working on uh, viruses uh, enhancement or gene modification? And then there was an accident where somebody was infected in the lab and then infected their families and friends. It is possible on the claim you just uh, mentioned, uh, the scientists are analyzing to know if it's uh, real or not.
Look at him, weaseling his way around. Our scientists are looking into this, but Maria have to go goodbye. And now you know why this guy deleted his Twitter account after he sold hundreds of millions of dollars worth of Moderna shares. Folks, they've been lying to you, and the cats are about to come out of the bags. Now, let's answer some viewers' questions and grab your tinfoil hats because you're gonna need them. Question number one, it says, thanks for the brilliant tips. It's not actually a question, it's, it's a comment. But anyways, thanks for the brilliant tips on the market. My one point of confusion, you seem to take two stands on the politics. On the one hand, you feel our sanctions are weak and we should do more. On the other hand, you seem to be commenting that we should not be involved at all, since the average Joe doesn't care. Anyway, to the latter, you know when uh, your global superpower is pretty much not an option. Geopolitics is quite complex. What happens over Overseas has an impact of varying degrees on American speci Americans, especially, or American security, or American billionaires' pockets. That's true, for sure. Anyways, just thought I'd point out that I was getting mixed messages. Not sure where you stand. Here's where I stand. I'm an isolationist. I don't believe in this adventurism overseas. Because if history is correct, every time it turns out to be a disaster, be it Vietnam, be it Iraq, be it Afghanistan, be it Latin America, every time we get involved in a conflict, we get stuck in there, we have no exit plan at all, and somehow the American people walk out poorer while the fat cat billionaires and the oligarchs walk out richer. So it is not in the interest of the American people that we get involved in every conflict out there. When it comes to sanctions, sanctions are a joke. They're ineffective at all. We've been sanctioning Russia for years. We've been sanctioning Iran for years. And look at how that one is going. But my point is, if you're gonna talk tough, if you're gonna say to the Russians, if you invade, we're gonna hit you with sanctions the likes of you've never seen before. We're gonna cripple your economy, yada, yada, yada. And then they invade and uh, we slap them on the wrist. What kind of message does that send out there? Because our credibility is already damaged from Afghanistan, the disaster of Afghanistan last year. Every so-called ally that depends on us ends up being thrown under the bus. Have you noticed that? But every ally of Russia, for example, be it Syria, be it Kazakhstan, the Russians are going to stand with you through and through. Now, we have a history of throwing allies under the bus. The Shah of Iran, uh, Egypt, Mubarak. He was an ally for 30 years. All of a sudden, he has to go. So the credibility of this country is already damaged. There is no way around it. So again, I believe that sanctions are ineffective, but you got to walk the walk. You cannot bluff, and then you get squeezed, and then you walk the walk. It sends out a weak image. We cannot do that when we have global conflicts like this. Now, here's what I want to say about this conflict, frankly speaking, to be honest with you. I've been buying the narrative from the get-go until last night when I did my own research. You know, the dangerous, don't do your own research. That's what they keep telling us. But there is something peculiar when you have CNN, Fox, MSNBC, all of them beating on the same drum, the same propaganda. They've been selling us these stories that the Ukrainians are somehow beating the Russians, they're crushing the Russians, they're stopping them. Putin is getting humiliated out there. We have fake stories about the ghost of Kiev, one plane, Ukrainian plane, that took down 9, 10, 11, 12, 20, 60 Russian jets. Are we children to believe this garbage? When all of them do the same propaganda, this is an order that came from the big guy. We're in wartime, stop the bipartisanship and go with the narrative. Therefore, all of them are selling you the same narrative across television. Doesn't matter what channel you watch. So for me, something already smells fishy here. We've been fooled once, folks, with Iraq. Something smells fishy. I don't know what it is. And then I look at the map. Of Ukraine, the invasion. Now I'm looking at the territories that the Russians captured. They haven't captured Odessa, which is one of the most important cities in Ukraine, a very important port in this particular country. So if you're gonna invade Ukraine, why wouldn't you capture an important city like Odessa? Up till last night, I had no clue at all. Why are the Russian forces concentrating on three cities in particular? Kiev, Kharkiv, and Mariupol. Why are all the forces of the Russian forces heading to these three cities in particular? And then I hear all of this propaganda on TV, the Russian forces are getting crushed, yada, yada, yada. I'm asking myself a question. Why is Putin sending his B team, not the A team, the B team, to do this job? Because if Putin wants to crush Ukraine, as, as they've been selling us, if he wants to take over cities and kill civilians, he could do that easily, in a day. He could flatten the entire country. I mean, Russia has some of the most devastating weapons ever. Why not deploy them if the goal is to crush Ukraine, to take it over entirely? Some disturbing images. Russia sending in these so-called 
uh, heavy flamethrowers that are capable of shooting uh, thermobaric mm -hmm. rockets. Uh, tell us about that. Our, our viewers, some of our viewers may not be aware of what that even is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an observation that we made today where we saw one of these uh, um, uh, multiple rocket launching systems, which the Russians call a flamethrower, called a TOS-1. Now that uh, flamethrower actually, or, or rocket launcher, uses thermobaric or weapons with thermobaric warheads. And essentially what that does is it sets the air on fire uh, and then sucks the oxygen out of people's lungs. So it's definitely a very severe weapon. I've been thinking about this and then it hit me because I've been really baffled by Putin's call when he initiated the war. He called Ukrainians, the Ukrainian government, as infiltrated by Neo, the word that I can't say, but the people who sympathize with the guy with the funny mustache from a hundred years ago. I can't say his name because the robot police will go, what, 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 what did he say here? Should we censor or what? But I think you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Easy. Oh, oh. <laughs> I thought it was the old German. <laughs> right? No, it's not. So I did some research, and it turns out Ukraine in recent years have become a mecca for the admirers of the guy with the funny mustache from 100 years ago. Matter of fact, they come from all over the place, from Sweden, from Germany, from Brazil, from the US. And all of them are joining this movement in Ukraine. And by the way, I posted about that on Twitter. I'm not going to talk about it here in this channel because I'd like to keep the channel. And the scope of this channel is financial markets and the economy. And this geopolitical problem is important for financial markets and the economy, and therefore we're talking about it. And then I heard another speech by Putin where he says, I'm not going to fight the Ukrainian defense defense forces or the civilians. I'm going to fight the guys, the admirers of the funny mustache from 100 years ago. You know who I'm talking about? Основные бои столкновения российской армии, как и ожидалось, происходят не с регулярными частями вооруженных сил Украины, а с националистическими формированиями, которые, как известно, и несут прямую ответственность and for now, that perhaps explains why he did not capture Odessa. He's only concentrating on three cities, which happen to be where the concentration of the admirers of the guy with the funny mustache from 100 years ago is. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not that naive to believe Putin. I believe he has other ulterior motives, such as restoring the Soviet Union. But again, our side also lies all the time. We have a part of the story that's not being told here. Our side lied before. The WMDs in Iraq that are still not found, by the way, but somehow Halliburton scored some nice deals in Iraq. So to wrap it up here, my point from all of this is the following. It appears that this Russia-Ukraine conflict has more to do than we've been told. It involves years and years of ethnic problems and regional problems. In other words, it's not our problem. We have problems here at home, primarily inflation and many other problems, by the way. And for the tough guys who are pounding at the chest right now in social media, on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, let's show Putin, let's send some arms, let's send some military over there. How far do you want to push this thing? Because again, we're not dealing with Iraq, we're not dealing with some banana republic out there, we're dealing with a country that has thousands of nuclear weapons. Do you really want to see what a nuclear war looks like? Because there are not going to be any Starbucks left. You're not going to be able to slurp and soy lattes anymore. The war is going to come here. Let's see how tough you're going to be when the war comes here. But I know what you're going to say. He's just bluffing. He's not going to do it. Yeah, bluffing just like when you said he's not going to invade and now he's already there. Watch out here. If you think this guy is an erratic madman, you don't want to really trust that he's bluffing. So once again, my question is, how far do you want to push this thing? We have many problems at home. And listen to this clip from CNN. I was watching this last night, or yesterday, I should say. It's from Jay Johnson, the Homeland Security for the Obama administration, I believe. He also brought up the point that in the next few days, we will see the Russian forces massacring Ukrainians, and the images are going to be difficult for American viewers. And soon enough, we will see pressure on the Biden administration that we should get militarily involved in this conflict. And then something amazing happened. Take a listen. I believe that this is going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, I believe it's going to be ugly. I believe it's going to be bloody. Americans need to prepare themselves for some of the images we are going to see of civilian casualties in Ukraine. Many Americans will then ask, why aren't we doing something about this militarily? Why aren't we intervening? Why aren't we getting into this fight? And the Biden administration will come under tremendous international and domestic political pressure to intervene militarily, despite President Biden's pledge 
not to put boots on the ground in, in Ukraine. And so very soon, the Biden administration, I predict, is going to reach a serious decision point about what to do in this, in this situation, consistent with our values as Americans, Wolf. Uh, we have in the past um, intervened militarily to defend freedom, but we need to remind ourselves that in situations like this, whether it's Ukraine or Libya or Vietnam or Kosovo, very often, or Afghanistan, very often it's much easier to actually get into a situation like this than it is to extract yourself from a situation like this. So, so far, he's been saying the pictures are going to be difficult. The American public is going to support a military intervention at some point. And then Wolf hits him with the reality. And look how fast he backpedals. And the fear is that if the U.S. or the NATO allies, for that matter, were to get militarily involved with boots on the ground in Ukraine uh, with anti-aircraft missiles, with warplanes flying over, uh, that could lead to a direct conflict, a direct war with Russia, a nuclear power, right? Correct. And we have managed to avoid a direct conflict with Russia through the entire Cold War, through the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, where things were pretty intense then. Uh, we skillfully maneuvered around a direct conflict militarily with Russia. And if we're not careful now, we could find ourselves in exactly that. And so um, over the next days, weeks, it's going to take a lot of discipline and, and deliberate thinking on the part of President Biden and his cabinet uh, to avoid a direct confrontation with Russia as they have pledged to try to avoid. So all of a sudden, when reminded with the nukes, he's like, oh shit, yeah, right, yeah, the nukes, yeah. Well, how, could, how could I forget about that? We shouldn't get involved without thinking properly about this. By the way, here it is. Today, Putin is threatening to use nukes. Folks, this is becoming really dangerous. It's not a game on social media that you can play and stick it to the Trumpers. This is real life. Do you want to risk nuclear war? For what? We have problems in this country, primarily inflation. I say we stay home. We concentrate on the problems that we have right here. Of course, it's a tragedy. I think Putin made a big mistake, even if he's right, that he's just fighting the guys who are with the ideology, the guy with the funny mustache from 100 years ago. He kind of screwed up because he alienated all Ukrainian people and the world. And we should leave it at that. This is a European problem. Let them clean their mess. The Maverick of Wall Street says, stay home. Let's do another question, this time for the market and the coverage in this channel. The viewer says, hi Maverick, is it possible for you to stop going over the same charts every day? Gold, BTC, AMC that may not have trade setups. It would be more valuable looking at charts for possible trade ideas like EEM, this is for emerging markets, as supported by flow or fundamentals. Now here's the thing, we have two kind of charts. We have tradable charts like the SPY, the Qs, the IWM, and then we have indicator charts like gold, the dollar, the 10 year yield, and these are really important. For example, one of the reasons why I spotted Thursday's reversal is the indicator charts. We palladium, gold, oil, the 10-year yield. So these indicator charts become really relevant and important in your trading endeavor. But rest assured, I'm going to cover for you especially the chart of emerging markets and the EWZ, the Brazilian ETF. But with that, folks, we're going to move on here and cover the market information for you. We start with the performance of indices last week. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average on Friday closed in the green big time by 834.92 points or a gain of 2.51%. The Nasdaq also closing in the green by 221.4 points or a gain of 1.64%. The S&P 500 was also in the green by 95.95 points, look at that, or a gain of 2.24%. What about the sector's performance of Friday? All in the green, massive rally, led by materials at number one, capturing the gold medal. Number two for the silver, defensives. Number three for the bronze, financials. Let's contrast all of this with the performance for the week. And coming up, number one, capturing the gold medal, utilities. Number two for the silver, healthcare. Number three for the bronze, REITs. Obviously a defensive theme for the week. And the laggard, big time, was consumer cyclicals. What about the advanced decline ratios on Friday? NYSE, 82% advancing versus 15% declining. The NASDAQ, 71% advancing versus 25% 
declining. And every time we see these exaggerated numbers to the upside or the downside, the opposite move, usually not always, happens in the pre-market. Futures, what's going on here? On Friday, we saw a down day. When we look at the indicators, palladium, oil, wheat, gold, all of them were down and hence the market rally. But this is not going to last. The dips in these names, specifically as the conflict continues to escalate, the dips will be bought, we will see more inflation expectations, and the stock market will get rattled again. The WTI on Friday was down about 1%, Brent almost half a percentage point to the downside, gasoline, heating oil, natural gas were all down. But we have more tailwind for oil, by the way, because over the weekend we have some disruption of the supply from Iraq, about 480,000 barrels a day due to a protest in that country. So once again, expect crude to rebound significantly higher. What about softs? Friday was a flattish day for cocoa, cotton, OJ, coffee, lumber, on the other hand, sugar, aided on the chin, down about 1.5%. Metals, gold was down, palladium was down big, over 5.5%. This was an indicator that we're buying the dip in the stock market. But again, palladium will rebound, I have no doubt in my mind at all. Silver was down Friday, all of these names will rebound higher, gold, silver, palladium, perhaps even platinum. But copper has been trading in the opposite direction. For example, if palladium is higher, copper goes down. On Friday, palladium was down, copper was in the green. We have to watch out for this theme if it's going to hold on or not. What about meats? A flattish day for live cattle. Meanwhile, modest gains for feeder cattle. On the other hand, the new big tech lean hogs also getting dragged down by a little over one and a half percent. Lastly, what about grains? Down across the board big time. But the leading indicator that we have here is wheat. Wheat was down 8%. And pretty much precisely, by the way, from the resistance that I gave you on the chart just a day ago. But my expectations are wheat will rebound significantly higher. Any dip is an opportunity to buy in grains. Moving on to options, the big casino. On Friday, the action remained flattish, no increase in volume whatsoever except for Apple, which came at number one with almost 1.4 million contracts. About 63% of those were calls. Tesla, the souffle, number two with about 955,000 contracts. About 55.5% of those were calls. So we're seeing a shift from puts to calls slightly. I believe this will be a bull trap. You gotta be careful here. AMD at number three with about 600,000 thousand contracts about 72.5% of those were calls. What about the unusual activities that took place in the options market on Friday? We start with the ticker CLF for Cleveland Cliffs. The name got hit big time, but somebody's buying the dip here, betting on a rebound by buying the 23 calls for the expiration date, May 20th, with expectations that the name could rebound higher by more than 7% by then. They paid about one buck and 85 cents a piece to enter the strain, all in all spending about three and a half million dollars. What about the ticker SQ? Q Square, also known as Block right now. No wonder why the name is down big. Perhaps by Block they meant the chopping block. But anyways, somebody's buying more puts here, fading the rip that we got this week. They're buying the 110 puts for the expiration date, March 4th. With expectations, the name could drop down by more than 8% by then. They paid about one buck and 60 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about two million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker E or A E R? Excuse me for Air Cap Holdings. This is an Irish company that leases aircraft engines across the globe, but specifically in China. The name is pretty much at all-time highs, but somebody's buying protection or fading the rip. They're buying the 57 and a half puts for the expiration date, March 18th, with expectations that the name could drop down by more than eight and a half percent by then. They paid about one buck and twenty-five cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about one point three million dollars. What about the ticker AMGN Amgen? They're buying puts here, the two hundred puts for the expiration date April 14th. With the expectations, the name could drop down by more than 12% by then. They paid about one buck and a half a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about 1.4 million dollars. Continuing with interesting trades, what about the trade for the ticker XLE? This is for the energy ETF. They're buying the dip big time. In this case, the 79 calls for the expiration date April 14th. With the expectations, the name could pop higher by more than 14.5% by then. Watch out the spread here. It's wide. They paid about at three bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending about two million dollars. Lastly, at the bottom of the table, what about the ticker MSFT Microsoft? 
was an ad performer this week, but if everything goes down, Microsoft will also go down, yet somebody bought calls, the 320 calls, for the expiration date April 1st, with expectations that Microsoft could move higher by more than 7.5% by then. They paid about 2 bucks and 60 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending about $800,000. And by the way, we also have some put options buying for the ticker BLL ball, in case you want to fart in a jar, somebody's fading that. Anyways, moving on to the heat map analysis. Friday's heat map was lighting up green. It was a sea of green with very few exceptions. We have some no some notable movers that we have to worry about at least. Among them Twitter, which is selling one billion dollars of junk bonds to fund share buybacks. What could go wrong here? Perhaps Twitter is going down to zero. Then we have NVIDIA, which mysteriously, of course, got hit with a cyber attack on Friday. We have yet to get the details from NVIDIA, hopefully. We can get some details this Monday. But let's contrast this heat map, a sea of green, with the performance of the heat map from the weekly perspective. And as you can see, drastically different, but notable movers. Look at Microsoft, leading the rally in the big caps. Look at Apple. You're seeing the contrast now. Microsoft got hit hard in the last few weeks. Apple did not. Now we're seeing Microsoft rebounding and Apple starting to take it on the chin. Then, perhaps this is really worrisome by the way, the ticker TSM Taiwan was down over 7% for the week. Is this a leading indicator that Taiwan will get hit next? We'll see. Then on financials, we have PayPal, the ticker P. YPL, and if you follow the trade that I played buying the dip on Thursday, these calls, folks, appreciated by over 500%. The big pharma names continue to hold on. Look at AbV, an impressive performance so far. The ticker ABBV. When we look at the industrials, look at Lockheed, General Dynamics, Raytheon, all surging higher. And they will continue to surge higher, by the way. So you want to buy the dip in these. Chevron and oil blasting higher. I believe this is the time when you rotate from Exxon to Chevron. So the dips will be bought in Chevron. Likewise, in materials, look at the insane ad performance of agricultural stocks, specifically fertilizers. Mosaic, Nutrin, these are good names. You got to buy the dip in these. Likewise, in defensives, another name that we continue to buy the dip in is the ticker ADM for Archer Daniels. And the reason is... If wheat prices are about to explode, the assumption is that this name will benefit from the rise in grains prices. But again, there is a limitation here to how much they can pass to the end consumer. And therefore, I say stick to the source, the fertilizer names, in this case, Mosaic. Another very important move in this week's action is Tesla. Tesla is down over 7.5%. You gotta start to worry about these names, the high momentum mega cap names, Apple and Tesla. If they start to fall, they were heading in really dangerous territory here, folks. And of course, we talked about Home Depot, Home Depot down big, over 9, almost 9% for the week. We already covered that. So we're moving on to the charts analysis, and we start with SPY's chart, 30 minutes chart. A massive impulsive rally higher of 410 and a half. We're now eyeing 438 as resistance. The problem is the formation is bullish, it is a bull flag formation. But I'm putting the question mark right next to it, and the reason is look at the RSI indicator down there. It's way overbought. Every time we saw the RSI indicator right there, it is a signal to take profits and perhaps initiate some shorts looking for a pullback. It doesn't mean that the market will give up all of the gains, but it means we're looking for a pullback, a retracement to let's say 434, perhaps the line in the sand at around 430, and then we'll take it from there. Here's a daily chart for the continuous contract for the S&P 500. Once again, an impulsive rally higher. We stopped at around 4,384 and a half precisely. The bulls scored major gains. The key here for the victory for the bulls is keeping 4,232 intact as support. Look at the volume. It moved a little to the downside. So this is a good sign for the bulls. The momentum indicators are moving higher. The problem is with the tensions that are going on, I believe the futures are down as I'm speaking right now. So we'll see if we have another movement of dip buying that will keep 4,232 intact. Otherwise, if that line is breached, folks, it is a strong shorting signal. And here is the SPX, the cash index chart from a daily perspective. If we have another buy the dip 
and a rally higher. We could go all the way to retest the 200 days moving average. If we do that in one shot, it will be a strong signal to take profits and fade the rip. I continue to hold that we will go down and retest 4,000 as support sooner or later. What about the Qs? The Nasdaq a daily, excuse me, a 30 minutes chart. Once again, an impulsive rally forming a bull flag consolidation. But I have the question mark, and the reason is look at the RSI from a 30 minutes perspective. Highly extended, meaning we have to pull back. When we pull back, the line in the sand is already there. 343. So if we gap down in the morning, we have 334. We better rebound from that point on, or it's going to get ugly quickly, folks. I'm looking at the futures once again, and they appear to be down, at least for now. This is a nasty action by the market. And the reason is a lot of folks, including myself, by the way, bought call options riding the way higher the dip. We did not get a reversal signal on Friday whatsoever. So now, those of us who are still holding on some put options or perhaps bought the dip in stocks are gonna wake up with a nice warm pie in the face. The question is, will the dip be bought once again or are we gonna see impulsive selling? The number you gotta watch for is 334. If that is breached, say goodbye. And here's a daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. What a beautiful rebound from the trend line in yellow. The technicals matter, folks. And we're now trading above 14,000. This is a massive victory for the bulls. Again, the futures appear to be down, but that doesn't take away the victories for the bulls, meaning there is still momentum here to buy the dip again. And we have to look down at 13,599. You can round that up to 13,600. If that holds, and it appears that we have more dip buying to come. The volume is moving higher on the buying side. The momentum indicators are improving, but they're not out of the woods yet. The bears have to look for the violation of 13,599. If that is breached, then it is a shorting signal. What about the IWM? Another impulsive rally, a vertical rally to the upside. It is a bullish formation, but look at the RSI. It got to pull back if you get this high. We have 196.5 as support. Let's see if this one's going to hold or not. If it doesn't, it's an ominous signal. The bears are pushing back again. If it holds, then it's a good sign for the bulls to buy the dip once again. Here's the problem, by the way. When we look at the rut, the Russell 2000 from a weekly chart perspective, we are below the line in the sand 2100. We're forming a bear flat formation. Yet we have a double bottom for now. So can the Russell 2000 rally to recapture 2100 by the end of the week? And if it happens, it will be a significant bullish development for the Russell. I doubt it because once you breach an important line like 2100, and you form a bear flag pattern, the likelihood is sooner or later, you're gonna flush down. Here is a daily chart for the Dixie, the dollar index. It lost 97 as support, and it maintains 96 for now. The dollar is gonna be really volatile, and the reason is the fluctuation in the Russian ruble. Now that we have upping the ante in the sanctions and the rhetoric, we're almost, we're an inch away from getting into World War III. So the ruble can continue to crash big time, and this will be a rocket fuel for the dollar to shoot up higher. If that happens, by the way, folks, a higher dollar is not really good for stocks. It's going to crush the margins out there. Moving on to gold. Gold is pulling back from overbought conditions. But with these things going on, the Russia-Ukraine tensions and war and perhaps World War III, you're going to buy every dip of gold. Every dip has to be bought. Gold is the true and only store of value. Here's a chart, a daily chart for the 10 year yield. It continues to hold on at 1.94. This was a signal, by the way, that inflation expectations are not gonna go down and the Fed will have no choice but to become hawkish and increase interest rates either way, whether we have Russia, Ukraine or not, which is a bad, bad scenario for the stock market, folks. You gotta be careful out there. Now, this chart has been an indicator of the conflict between Russia, Ukraine, meaning an increase of the hostility out there and retaliations and perhaps shutting the flow of gas and we see wheat and palladium futures shooting up higher you're gonna see more buying of bonds the rush to safety and therefore the 10-year yield could keyword could lose 194 and a half of support but the resiliency this chart it just amazes me here's a weekly chart for the tlt again it knocked at 140 once my hunch is it's gonna knock again and the second knock 
it will make it higher and recapture 140 as support. If that happens, yields will go down. There is no guarantee though that this time around it will be TLT higher, NASDAQ also higher because there is two kind of buying of the TLT. There is the buying on lower inflation expectations. This is good for the NASDAQ. And then there is the buying, the panic buying. We have a lot of risk and a lot of uncertainty in the geopolitical arena. This kind of buying doesn't produce a pop in the NASDAQ all the time. Here's the VIX, four hours chart. The support, now resistance of 33 is lost. Look at the MACD indicator, it's still flashing red, meaning it is a confirmation that the VIX is weak for now. And the SPY is moving higher. The problem is, this is a point for the bears, market bears that is. The VIX chart is still elevated, by the way. It's still trading above 20. You're not really out of the woods. And this is for market bulls. You're not out of the woods until we have a weekly closing below 20. This has yet to happen. So for all we know, the tensions could wrap up higher. And the VIX could recapture 33. If that happens, the recapturing of 33, it will be a confirmation that indeed, you got to fade this rip and start shorting the stock market. In this case, the SPY. What about a four hours chart for the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ? Again, we're seeing a crossing in the MACD indicator to produce a red impression on the histogram. This this has yet to be confirmed for now. The VXN is making higher lows. Notice that. So it could pop higher. But for now, you're seeing market bulls, in this case, NASDAQ bulls, scoring some gains here. They're fighting back big time. The line in the sand is 27 and a half. So long as we're trading above that number, the NASDAQ is really risky. And when we play pops, you got to take your profits quickly. At least take half of the position off so you don't eat a pie if we have a quick reversal, specifically overnight. Here's the daily chart for Apple. An impressive reversal higher. It has yet to retest the upper range of the channel, which is now resistance, as you can see in yellow. If that test is passed and Apple pops higher, we have 172.4 as resistance. But we're seeing a lot of weakness, relative performance weakness by Apple versus the peers. So in all likelihood, Apple will not be able to make it all the way there. And it's going to have to go down to retest 157 as support. Now, I'm not going to say that this chart is out of the woods yet, unless we see a retest of 157 once again and a rebound higher a recapture of the upper edge of the channel which is now resistance and turning it into support why am i having such high standards for apple because the market is getting really risky and apple has yet to be hit google got hit microsoft got hit facebook for sure got hit it is now Apple's time to get hit. Moving on to Tesla, the souffle in hourly chart. It's a bullish formation. It's a bull flag. We look at the RSI. It is not overbought by any means. And therefore, if you're holding Tesla calls, you're supposed to move higher. The technicals say Tesla will move higher. The problem is if we have route in the stock market and panic selling in the morning, then that's that. There is nothing you can do here. You followed the technicals correctly, but it's a tough game. Once in a while, you got to eat a pie in the face. What about Tulips BTC? Again, this is a lead indicator and has been trading down hence the ugly opening for futures right now is what we're seeing a formation of a bear flag if it is the case then the support of 35,750 will not hold we will go down to the inevitable 30 thousand as support lastly or not lastly we have more charts but amc an hourly chart it bounced higher from oversold conditions now it becomes a matter of time time is more important than price in this chart what do i mean if the buyers don't show up and push this chart to retest 21 remember it retested it once it failed it tried to retest it twice it failed again is third time a charm or what if it doesn't happen quickly if the apes don't buy the dip quickly, then time will become more important. We'll look at the monthly chart. We're seeing a crossing the monthly MACD producing a red impression on the histogram. Absent for rescue mission right now, this week, as soon as we can. This chart is going down to zero. And here's the weekly chart for EEM emerging markets. It has been a downtrend. We have a sloping line of resistance. We have 50 and a half as the important line here. Now the chart is going to pop above the sloping line of resistance and 50 and a half at some point. When? That remains to be seen. Do you want to take the risk now and buy the dip in EEM? Or do you want to wait till the crossing already happens? And we have 50 and a half as support for sure. And then you buy. There is still a lot of meat in the bone to chew on here. You don't have to rush and pull the trigger a little too soon. And here's the EWZ. This is a monthly chart. It has been on a downtrend. Then came the crash of 2020. The Brazilian market tried to recover. It failed to do so until, of course, when the Lula optimism showed up. 
We have a double bottom for now from a monthly chart perspective. We're making a higher low. Another way we can look at the chart is we're making another double bottom formation, at least for now. Here's another way you can look at it. What if this is a formation for cup and handle? The Brazilian market right now, remember, it suffered from massive inflation last year. It got hit hard. It is the lagger. It is where value is right now. And the Brazilian economy happens to be rich with commodities. So if we have hyperinflation, this is one country that will benefit tremendously. It was just looking for the political chaos. And now that we have Lula optimism, the Brazilian market is recovering. It's not going to be an easy ride buying the EWZ right now because we will have a lot of political turbulence with the elections. So you always have to buy puts once in a while if you're gonna buy the EWZ. Lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the Chicago PMI. We also have another Fed zombie here from Atlanta, Raphael Boystick speaking. But this week will be eventful with a lot of macro data. The Chicago PMI, we have Powell speaking, we have Bullard speaking, we have more PMIs, we have the most important non-farm payrolls on Friday, then we have more rate decisions by other central banks. Let's play a little game of geography here. On Tuesday, we have Australia. I know that. Then we have Wednesday, Canada. I better know that. Thursday in pink, we have... What is what is that country over there? Oh, Ukraine, right? The country we've been talking about all the time. Next to it, I believe that is Hungary. And then down in Asia, we have... What is that? Malaysia, Singapore? I don't know. And Friday, below India, we have Maldives, Sri Lanka. There we go. What do I know? I barely graduated college, folks. But anyhow, this is all I got for you for now. This is going to be an important week, critical, with a lot of action. If you thought you've seen it all, you haven't seen anything yet. So buckle up your seatbelts. But for now, I got to say goodbye. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow.